Encik Afif. I need your help. Can you enlighten me about Spina Bifida? Good morning, Puan Tahira. Sure, I can explain about it. Before that, I want to ask, what have you read about Spina Bifida? Before that, I'll explain briefly about the spine. The spine or the backbone is the body's central support structure. A healthy spine has three natural curves that makes an S shape. These curves absorb shocks to the body and protect the spine from injury. There are 33 vertebrae that make up five distinct spine segments. The first one is the cervical, or also known as the neck vertebrae, from C1 to C7. The second one is the thoracic vertebrae from T1 to T12. Next is the lumbar vertebrae from L1 to L5 and followed by sacrum vertebrae S1 to S5 and finally coccyx or known as tailbone. Spina bifida can occur anywhere along the spinal axis but most commonly is found in the lumbar region. I have read that spina bifida is a congenital disorder characterized by third closure of the neural tube which results in abnormalities of the vertebral column or the spinal cord and the prevalence of it is approximately 1 over 1,000 births in the United States and the Europe and up to 140,000 births are recorded per year worldwide Spina bifida is divided into two Spina bifida occulta and Spina bifida occulta Spina bifida occulta is a closed spinal dystrophism which is the mildest form of the neural tube defects that involves a hidden vertebral defect and minimal neural involvement. And the spina bifida aperta is an open spinal dystrophism that refers to a defect in which the neural tissue communicate with the external environment such as meningocell or myelomeningocell. Clinical features can include hairy patch of the skin or dimple that can be seen where the spinal defect is the extrusion of meninges and CSF, but without the involvement of the neural animal, such as myelomeningosum. Are these clinical features are symptoms of spasticity, pain, neurogenic bowel and bladder, cognitive deficit due to hydrocephalus, seizure, and motor deficit. Defects in neural tube development are possible to be multifacial, including environmental and genetic factors. The most common environmental factors is folic acid deficiency. Programs for dietary folate fortification have been implemented which have decreased the prevalence of spina bifida by 28%. Other environmental factors include methanol obesity, methanol diabetes, and teratogens such as valproic acid. Valproic acid has the highest association with the development of neural tube defect carrying about tenfold increase in risk. Some genetic factors have also been correlated with poor neuralization including several chromosome syndromes and genetic polymorphism. While neural tube defects are typically isolated defects, some are associated with chromosome syndromes, most often transomitidine and etin. Other than that, Research has also implicated that polymorphism of the gene according to the MTHFR enzyme which involves in folate metabolism as a likely genetic factor in spina bifida. Next, we move to the prevention of spina bifida. The prevention of neurotube defects by folic acids has been heralded as a modern public health success. A study has found that diets and postpartum blood levels of women who had a pregnancy affected neurotrope defects were mildly deficient for micronutrients include folate. A folate contained multivitamin supplement which to reduce the risk of neurotrope defect recurrence in women with previously affected pregnancy. It is recommended that high-risk women to take 4 mg of folic acid while low-risk women are advised to take 0.4 mg of folic acid. Next, can you perhaps explain the ICF of spina bifida? Sure, I can, Puan Tahira. I will then explain map of health condition according to ICF. 
Commonly, patients will have impairment at body function and body structure, such as low skin integrity, poor muscle strength, and poor dexterity and coordination. So, patients will have limitation in self-care activities, domestic life, and mobility. It will also restrict in participation, such as education, work, and leisure activities. In environmental factors and personal factors are also interrelated to this health condition. Now, I will explain about frame of reference that use to treat spinal bifida. The first one is biomechanical FOR, which is considered as a remedial approach focusing on impairment that limit occupational performance. Next is rehabilitative FOR, which is considered rehabilitation as the process of facilitating patients in fulfilling their activities and social roles with competence. I see. From what I understood, since spina bifida has problem in mobility, the aim is to improve motor function by increasing and maintaining ROM of the lower limb. Occupational therapists are also responsible to strengthen the limb muscles that correlates to the level of injury such as weakening of the upper extremity or lower extremity. Pain should also be addressed since spina bifida patient may have problem with pain at opening or surgical site. And for rehabilitative frame of reference, assistive device such as crutches or wheelchairs for mobility purpose and catheter for bowel and bladder management are commonly prescribed to patients with spina bifida. By providing these aids, it can improve the patient's independence in ADL. Okay, Pantahira, why don't you try plan the intervention for bowel and bladder management for spina bifida? Maybe clean intermittent catheterization using visual clues can be used. The tube is inserted into the bladder to drain the urine and usually used for individuals that can no longer urinate normally. The process of self-catheterization includes inserting, washing, care and storage and it is usually done every 4 to 6 hours or 4 to 6 times daily. Don Lau et al has mentioned that the important predictors for independence in toilet activity were related to the time processing ability. Next, we move to the next intervention which is mobility aids. Mobility aids are devices are designed to assist walking and to improve the mobility of people with mobility impairment. The aim of this intervention are to provide support of the patient while walking and to enhance functional mobility to perform self-care activities. According to Swaru Indias, the selection of mobility aids is primarily determined by lesion level affected by the patient. There are two level lesions that require mobility aids, which are high lumbar and low lumbar lesion level. The wheelchair need to prescribe in high lumbar lesion level and crutches need to be prescribed in client with low lumbar level. For the evidence base, according to Johnson and all in 2007, assistive technology has often been recommended to enhance performance and advance independence outcome in daily living, community participation, education, and employment. Next, we move to the next intervention, which is splinting. Almost all children with spina bifida, with the exception of some patients with low sacral level involvement, will require autosis for embolation. The aim of this intervention is to prevent further deformity of the client, to facilitate of independent mobility, to maintain the alignment and walking ability of the client. There are two types of spleen that commonly used in spinal bifida client, which are reciprocating the autosis and anchor for autosis. According to Swaru Indias in 2009, there are many indications for the use of autosis in the management of children with spina bifida, which include with the maintenance of alignment, prevention of deformity, correction of flexible deformity, facilitation of independent mobility, and protection for the excessive limb. In most severe cases related to cognitive and hand functions, the cognitive orientation to daily occupational performance (COOP) approach can be used. COOP is described as a client-centered and performance-based approach to problem-solving, 
which enables individuals to identify cognitive strategies to improve their skill acquisition through an interactive process. The client will identify the skills need to be learned, sets his or her own goals, and is actively involved throughout the process of solving problems and evaluating the performance of activities. In these cases, occupational therapists will assist in identifying, developing, and using cognitive strategies to help the client to perform daily activities. The four objectives of COOP approach is skill acquisition, cognitive strategy use, generalization, and transfer of learning. COOP is an 11-session intervention. During the first session, client will be introduced to the global strategy with the method goal, plan, do, and check. The client identifies three activity goals that he or she wants to achieve and rates his or her present level of performance and satisfaction with the performance. The subsequent 10 sessions focus on interactive use of the global strategy and on helping the client by guided discovery to discover his or her own plan. The client is also encouraged to use his or her plans at home between training sessions with the support of parents and family. The intensity should be according to the client's goals using the cognitive and motor training. And the grading should be according to the client's needs, such as increasing the frequency from once to twice a week or one hour to two hours a week. Penny Delstrand et al. in 2018 mentioned that the COOP approach is a promising approach for enabling young people with congenital diagnosis to achieve their occupational performance and executive functioning through strategy use. As conclusion, spinal bifida is a type of neural tube defect that affects the spine and is usually apparent at birth. Occupational therapies treat individuals with spinal bifida to maximize their participation for engagement in everyday activities such as education, play, and family life.